On April 3rd, 2009, the Worldwide Church of God officially changed its name to Grace Communion International. Throughout most of its history, the Worldwide Church of God had functioned as an apocalyptic cult led by one man named Herbert W. Armstrong. Upon his death in 1986, however, Herbert Armstrong appointed Joseph Dekoch Sr. as the new pastor general. And starting in the early 1990s, Dekoch Sr. and then later his son, Joseph Dekoch Jr., ushered in major doctrinal changes. Ultimately, they ended up rejecting all of the church's heretical teachings and became what today would be labeled as a mainstream evangelical church. That move from the fringes to the fold, though, came at an incredible cost. The organization lost more than half of its membership, and its income plummeted by 90%, forcing the church to sell its Pasadena headquarters and eventually its university in Big Sandy, Texas, as well. Joseph Dekoch Jr. also suffered death threats. He was even offered a million-dollar bribe to retract the church's new teachings and return to Armstrongism. Our guest today is none other than Joseph Dekoch Jr. himself. From 13 Media, I'm Trisha Jenkins, and this is Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. How could we have been so theologically ignorant. We did not understand grace. I don't know of anything like this that has ever happened. It's nothing short of miraculous. It's the whole belief system that's in error. It can't be fixed. It has to be demolished. I don't think that you know any organized group that calls itself a church that has ever changed its doctrine, that has ever admitted it had been wrong, that has ever admitted that it had taught something that it now finds was an error and admits publicly and tells the people it had been an error and now it preaches the truth. And yet, it, it has happened. But an organization that's come from cultism to Christ, could it take place in other organizations? Yes. Without a doubt, the Tkachis are controversial figures in the worldwide Church of God's history because during both of their reigns as pastor general, they worked to carry out an almost complete overhaul of Armstrong's doctrines. They started, and actually apparently with Armstrong's blessing, by reversing the church's teaching on medicine and healing. And then they eventually went further allowing members to celebrate birthdays and women to wear makeup. They then declared British Israelism as little more than a racist doctrine, and they came to embrace the concept of the Trinity, which the church had always denied. Well, the generally accepted Christian teaching about God, now getting into the Christian religion, is that God is a Trinity, that is, three persons in one. And they say it's one God, but in three persons. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. I used to sing that song before I knew better. I don't sing it anymore because it's as fake and false as it can be. Sometimes I think of these intellectuals as they are the SSSs. You know, smart, smart, stupid. That's just what it is. Eventually, Joseph Dekoch Sr. would give a famous sermon on December 24, 1994. In this sermon, Dekoch Sr. essentially told the church that it had been operating under the covenant of the Old Testament, where God required Sabbath-keeping and strict dietary laws and the observance of holy days to be saved, but that the church had completely ignored the New Testament that made that covenant obsolete. No longer were Christians required to adhere to these laws to be saved. All that was required now, Dekoch said, was a faith in Jesus Christ and a belief in grace.
the Worldwide Church of God, in other words, de-radicalized or unculted itself. The narrative that I always heard was that Joseph Dukach Sr. was a firm believer in Armstrongism until his son, Joe Jr., and his friend, Mike Fazell, started attending Azusa Pacific University, and in their divinity studies, they came to question the validity of a lot of Armstrong's tenets, and that then they, along with another friend named Greg Albrecht, convinced Joseph Dukach Sr. of the error of his and Armstrong's ways. And together, they tried to take the Worldwide Church of God from the fringe to the fold. It turns out that that narrative isn't exactly right. And today, I'm excited to share my conversation with Joseph Dukach Jr. about what went down behind the scenes and one of the biggest shakeups in modern American religious history. I wanted first, though, to go back to the very beginning to ask Joseph Dukach Jr. how he and his father ever got involved in Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God. I probably should start with growing up in Chicago, and that's where my parents first joined Armstrongism. My family, including my dad's parents and extended family, my grandfather's brother and wife and all my cousins, aunts and uncles, We all attended a Russian Greek Orthodox church on the south side of Chicago. In fact, my grandfather and his brother helped build that church. And growing up, the church was very mysterious to me. High liturgy, incense. I didn't know what was being said because all the service was done in Russian. But I knew when to stand and when to genuflect. And I I learned the dance, so to speak. My dad was an altar boy in that church, and he was the last one of our family to actually join. My grandparents and my mom all became enchanted with Armstrongism, joined the church, and and my dad was the last holdout. And he had terrible ulcers, and he was about to have an operation, and my mother asked if he would agree to be anointed by the ministers and be prayed over, and he thought... Why not keep my wife happy? And shockingly to him, he was healed. He didn't have to have an operation. And and so he thought, well, I'll become a serious member. Joseph says that despite his dad's initial reluctance to join Armstrongism, his dad eventually rose through the ranks as those around him noticed his strong work ethic and a desire to serve others. He was asked to become a deacon and then an elder, And then he was eventually hired by headquarters in Pasadena, and the family relocated out there. Eventually, Joseph Dukach Sr. would become the successor of Herbert W. Armstrong and the second pastor general of the Worldwide Church of God. And during the nine years that he led the church, Joseph Dukach Sr. and his son radically changed the church's doctrines and turned it away from its more cultish behaviors. So what actually went down behind the scenes? Well, first, Joseph Dukats Jr. says that under Armstrong's reign, there were, oh, maybe a half a dozen people before me who had, I'll call it, the same grace awakening. But because uh, there was no administrative support, they were summarily fired from their position. The benefit that Mike and Greg and I had, we were in pretty high positions in the administration, and my dad was supportive of us. So that dynamic was a key. And my dad was very open to making necessary changes, primarily because before Herbert Armstrong died, he had many meetings with my dad. And in several of those meetings, he would tell my dad, look, in the years to come, there's going to be things that need to be changed. Don't hesitate to seek out the truth and make the change. And my dad, at that point, didn't have a clue as to what needed really to be changed, aside from a few silly things that Armstrongism held, like not observing birthdays and women not wearing many makeup. Those things were, so to speak, no-brainers. Those could be fixed. 
And when my dad asked him to be specific, Herbert Armstrong would only say the church's teaching on healing needs to be fixed. The church's teaching on divorce and remarriage isn't exactly right. And he said, and there'll be multiple other things. And I have some in mind, but you'll discover them. And my dad told me that he really pressed that point a number of times in meetings with him. But that's all that Herbert Armstrong would say to him. So my dad felt, well, commissioned, so to speak, to make changes that he saw as being necessary. Now, the interesting thing about the story to me is that Mike and Greg and I all came to the same conclusions independent of each other. Now, I was good friends with Mike, and we would talk a lot. And I remember Mike coming into my office one day and closing the door and, and saying to me, you know, Joe, I am starting to wonder about this Trinity doctrine. And uh, I think it's probably right. And I hadn't given it too much thought. And uh, at that time, we had received a letter from a Roman Catholic Monsignor who was complimenting our Plain Truth magazine and saying that you have a wonderful magazine, but you have this stupid teaching about the nature of God. Why don't you fix it? So my dad wanted to write an answer back to this guy. And in my dad's mind, he's thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll straighten out this Roman Catholic's thinking. So our usual people to write the answers were a, a couple of guys in the letter answering department, a guy named Carol Miller or David Hunsberger. They brought the letter in and said, this is above our pay grade. We can't answer this. So my dad gave it to Mike Fazell and said, get together with Dr. Stavernides. And they were putting together an answer. And that's what got Mike really going in a new direction on thinking about the nature of God. And of course, my dad then got Mike and I together and said, look, I want you guys to study this out because I want to know the truth about this teaching. Now, I have to give you a funny background story, and I think you'll appreciate where it comes out. My dad's parents, of course, got baptized and uh, joined Armstrongism. But one thing they never abandoned was a belief in the Trinity. At the time, our pastor was a fellow named Dean Blackwell, and he would come over and visit my grandparents and try to convince them that the Trinity was wrong. And he would get nowhere with my grandfather. And he told my grandfather, look, you can keep coming to church as long as you keep this to yourself. Don't be trying to cause division. Don't be trying to tell other people that, that you don't believe in the Trinity. Just can you do that? My grandfather agreed. But he never abandoned his belief in the Trinity. So Mike and I are studying this. And we're reading everything that we can read about it. In fact, that's what got me going back to seminary to get in the MDiv and doctoral program, Mike as well. And we both concluded the Trinity doctrine is the, the only way to explain it. And our teaching was nothing more than polytheism. I mean, Herbert Armstrong taught, as you probably have heard, that God is a family. And he would say that the Trinity doctrine came from paganism. Well, as I studied it, I saw, no, it didn't. Polytheism is teaching God as a family, like the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, who had organizational charts of the family of gods. And I, I thought, how could I have not seen this? If you were to ask me to define polytheism, I would say more than one God. Yet I never saw Armstrong's position, two separate gods, is more than one God. And the only way I can explain that was cognitive dissonance. How could I believe two opposite things that hold them both to be true? But I did for 30 some years of my life. And so that was an awakening to me that if Herbert Armstrong could be so drastically wrong about a key doctrine of Christianity, that he might be wrong in other areas too. And one of those other areas was Armstrong's teaching that other Christians who are not a part of the Worldwide Church of God were fake Christians or believers who would never be saved. And in the background of my mind, I had always wondered about Christians in other churches, because I was taught growing up in Armstrongism that they're all false. They're fake Christians. Yet I worked in the real world. I didn't always work for the church. I, I worked for a semiconductor corporation. I worked for state government. 
And in all those places I've worked, there were other Christians, Methodists, Baptists, and I got to know them well, and I could see the sacrifices they would make. And I would have a hard time reconciling the label fake Christian, false Christian, because it, it could not be true. So with that in the background of my mind, and then face to face with the errors Armstrong taught about the nature of God, I knew there probably were other things that were wrong. So that was my epiphany, if you will. And, and it was gratifying that at the same time, Mike Fizell was going through the same thing in his mind, and so was Greg. And we kind of discovered that about each other. Now, when my dad had asked Mike and I to study out this Trinity doctrine and kind of give him a report, Mike and I were talking to each other saying, you know, you know how your dad sometimes can get angry. And when we go in and give this report, I don't know what he thinks. Do you know what he thinks? And I said, you know, Mike, I have no idea how he's going to react. He may get angry and fire both of us. I don't know, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> so we, Mike and I went into his office, closed the door, took about 20 minutes to explain. And we're sitting on the edge of our seat waiting for, is he going to explode and fire us? And it was absolutely the opposite. He said, wow, grandpa was right. Which, <laughs> I, I mean, when he said that, it dawned on me. Oh, yeah, he's talking about grandpa never abandoned the Trinity. So my dad then was very much supportive of, well, Mike and Greg and me in the articles and the preaching we did to try to affect change. But while Joe's dad was supportive of the doctrinal changes, even before they were publicly announced in that famous Christmas Eve sermon, Joe says that the battle lines and the splinter groups were already forming. Behind the scenes, <laughs> it was a tug of war because there were those that I was friends with who wanted me to repent and would invite me over for dinner and, and we'd have a nice meal and then they'd say, now Joe, we're here to kind of have an intervention to straighten you out. None of those went very well. So during that time, the lines were forming, battle lines were forming. And you were either for or against the Trinity. And what was surprising is that that's when the splinter group started. So uh, we started making those changes one at a time. And each time the battles got a little more fierce until finally a group of pastors were secretly meeting. I should say not so secretly meeting and, and planning the split. One time, one evening, Greg Albrecht and I were walking together from our offices up the hill. And a lady of one of the husbands that was leading the splinter groups came up to us and said, I will give you a million dollars if you will recant and stop teaching this. And Greg said, a million to split or a million each? And she stopped and looked a moment and kind of rubbed her chin and said, a million each. <laughs> and Greg and I were, well, befuddled. We said, you're kidding. You're offering us that much money. I'm sorry. We really believe in what we're doing. I'm, no amount of money is going to make us recant. And uh, that wasn't the worst part of it, though. The worst part of it was the death threats. Oh, my. I, it would be a nice, normal day. My phone in my office would ring. It would be a call from some state institution, like one I recall vividly was Texas. And they were telling me that it's their duty to inform me that they have a person on 72-hour hold because he has a rifle and he wanted to come out and shoot me. And they wanted me to be aware. But it wasn't just those kinds of calls. I got only a couple of those calls. Many anonymous letters saying they wanted to kill me. And one time in person, after church, a guy came up to me and said, I'd like to publicly execute you. I'd like to put you in a guillotine and cut your head off. And of course, the people standing around all got quiet. And, and I began looking around, where's my wife and children at? So yeah, that I want to say that was probably the most frightening part of it all. 
Joseph says that he and his dad tried to lay the groundwork for the changes during ministerial training conferences so that local ministers would be on board and prepared to explain the doctrinal shifts that the church was undergoing. But it quickly became clear that large-scale buy-in was not going to be easy. What we did was we tried to educate our worldwide ministry first before we made any announcements about it. And we held a series of, oh, off the top of my head, I want to say 10, maybe 12 regional conferences for ministers only. And Dr. Stavronides was sort of the man of the hour. And he led those presentations. And I'm going to say he was about 40% successful in getting people to see the truth. And, And I would say about the narrative, my dad, his issue was he wanted us to make the changes methodically and slowly. And as we told my dad several times, we're not the one with our foot on the accelerator. As soon as we explain one thing, 10 more doctrines are affected and questions are asked. And we can't tell people, but we're not going to answer that. (laughs) Well, give us a year and we'll answer it. So all these different narratives formed, the, the one you're referring to that my dad had to be convinced of the changes is not exactly right. My dad didn't know. And that's why he commissioned Mike and me to go study these things. So my dad would try to hold the hounds at bay by saying, well, we're not in a hurry to change anything. That's not going to change. And that unfortunately came across to many people as my dad is still a true believer and we are not, and we're trying to convince them. I mean, there another narrative that came out was that Mike and Greg and I were just still angry from abusive treatment that we got from the church growing up. And uh, that wasn't true either. I, I, don't, I never felt abused growing up in the church. But I think these were coping mechanisms for people to try to deal with what's happening right before them. And they come up with a narrative that helps them cope with it. Joe says that before challenging Herbert W. Armstrong's stance on the nature of God, he had also resisted the teaching of British Israelism, which we have already addressed and explained in several episodes on this series. He says that through study, he came to see that doctrine as little more than a racist stance that could not be supported historically or even with DNA evidence. If I remember correctly, British Israelism was before we, the Trinity. Because I remember I steer-headed that with regional conferences with all our ministry, explaining that British Israelism is nothing more than a racist teaching, and it's disproven in many ways. And I'm going to say that was initially successful. Got maybe, maybe two-thirds bought into the truth. But in the final analysis, when all the splinter groups formed, what we kept probably a third of our membership and 40% went to other churches or became agnostic or just disappeared. And then the remainder joined the splinter groups. As I talked about in the first episode of this series, the choice that members were faced with once the changes were announced could be categorized as traumatic. Members of the exact same family had to figure out where they fell and sometimes they reacted oppositely. Some families ended in divorce. Rifts were created between siblings, parents, grandparents, cousins, friends, and the stakes seemed high because it felt like people's salvation was on the line. I mean, Armstrong had been preaching for decades that he and then later Joseph de Koch were God's only modern-day apostles, and that they led God's one true church, and that only members of the Worldwide Church of God would be saved when the end times arrived. So to even consider going against those teachings seemed risky on an eternal scale. So how much of the emotional turmoil or the financial decline and membership fallout did the Takaches foresee? Initially, I was concerned. My first thought was things are going to blow apart. And I don't know what, what percentage will remain with our fellowship 
I, I had no idea how many splinter groups would form. I had no idea. And in talking with Mike Fazell, he said, no, Joe, you know, we're an organization of true believers. I think, I think they're all going to come over and the majority will come with us. And Mike convinced me of that. But as time went on, I think um, Mike also saw early on that that, that wasn't going to be the case. And, and we both would look at each other and say, we don't know what's going to remain. But w- the die was cast, so to speak. We had committed that we're going to tell the truth. And uh, for us, that was the moral question. One of the things that we were asked, in fact, I went on multiple radio programs, a few television programs, and I would be asked that very question, especially when I would appear on Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, and people would call in with their questions. And inevitably, and I went on his show about six or eight times, and each time someone would call in and say, why didn't you just walk away leave the church as it is, and go start up your own church. And my answer was, well, I'm not in the business of starting any church, but this is a high moral question. What would Jesus have me do? Would he have me walk away and leave people in deception? Or would he have me do my best to bring them out of deception? And I I said, every time I ask it that way, I come up with the same answer. Try to lead people away from deception. Don't leave them in their deception." So that answer didn't go over well with some people, but that's my honest, heartfelt opinion. Joe does admit, though, that at different moments in his life, he did think about just trying to quietly walk away from everything. The week after my dad died is when I was in turmoil, tossing that back and forth, because I I had called one of my friends that I used to work with in state government and said, is my old job open or anything equivalent? (laughs) And he said, well, your job isn't open, but I'm sure there's something equivalent. And anyway, I never got back to him, but I, I was weighing my options and I, yeah, I thought maybe I should walk away, but then talking with so many of my friends and, and, people I'd grown up with in the church, I I gathered a sense of duty that I shouldn't abandon them. And and so I didn't. I kind of came to the conclusion. And once I came to that conclusion, it was firm. I wasn't going to go back on it. But oh my, yes. Even uh, before my dad died, I wondered if I shouldn't make my exit. (laughs) But uh, I felt that would have been wrong as well because my dad initially hired me because he said he couldn't trust everyone and he could trust me. So, so I just felt the strongest possible sense of duty. And uh, that was the moral high ground that I should stay with. And so I couldn't turn my back on it. Joseph Dukacs Jr. would eventually go on to lead the new version of the Worldwide Church of God, taking it further and further into mainstream Christianity. In 1997, the church joined the National Association of Evangelicals, and in 2009, they eventually changed their name to Grace Communion International. Today, the GCI has about 700 congregations across the globe, ranging in size from 40 to 500 members. Most churches now meet on Sundays, although a few still choose to meet on Saturday. When I asked Dukacs Jr. to describe how GCI is different from the Worldwide Church of God and what that process of transition looked like, this is what he said. Well, we are no longer a legalistic personality cult. That's what we were under Herbert W. Armstrong. And during the changes, we still suffered from identity crisis, so to speak. I'll give you an illustration. I brought some neighbors of ours to church with us. And at that point, the congregation I was attending was meeting on Saturday, not because of the day, but because we got such a red hot deal from the Pentecostal church that we would lease it and we'd have it all day Saturday and we could use it during the week for meetings and whatever. They gave us such a good deal that we we couldn't turn it down. Anyway, so I brought my neighbors to church and afterwards my neighbor Jeff said, Joe, really enjoyed church, enjoyed the people. 
In fact, he knew some of the people because we'd go golfing and he knew some of my friends and he saw them there at church. And he said, boy, I, I could attend here, except you guys meet on Saturday. And his, his folks were Presbyterian. He said, and my po folks would not understand us meeting on Saturday. But it was nice for him to give me the feedback that meeting on Saturday was no good. And then the second thing was, he said, and as I walked around and talked to people, they were talking about going to the feast. They were talking about, remember the time in Jekyll Island or in Lake Tahoe? What was that about? And so he was wanting to know the background story. And so during that time, while our church was having a grace awakening, they were still always talking about the past. And if you're going to attract new people, talking about a past practice that you don't do anymore, it turns you off. It, it, it doesn't work. Now, fast forward to today, I'm going to say 90 5% of our churches meet on Sunday, and you don't hear people talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And the focus back then was on headquarters and what Herbert Armstrong was doing. This phrase that was often used is, hold up the hands and arms of the apostle, Herbert Armstrong. Well, the focus is completely the opposite now. Our focus is on the local congregation. What is the local congregation doing to proclaim the gospel? What is the local congregation doing to participate in the ministry of Jesus? It just turned on its head from what it was in the past. And all our people seem to have legalism antenna. When you hear anything said that smacks of legalism, our people know it because they lived it, they're sensitized to it. And I don't think you'll find it a surprising thing for me to say, a lot of churches today, evangelical, suffer from a bit of legalism. So. You won't find my name being said to hold up my arms and my hands, and I, I welcome any prayers anyone wants to give for me, but I'm not the focus anymore. We're in a new chapter of life, so to speak, with GCI, because we have congregations where the majority of people attending came in after the changes, don't know Herbert Armstrong, and they certainly never hear his name. I asked Joseph DeKotz Jr. to explain why he decided to change the name of the Worldwide Church of God more than 10 years after the quote-unquote changes. We joined the National Association of Evangelicals in 1997, and they had annual meetings, which I really enjoyed going to and meeting other denominational presidents. And as I got to know some of them, some of them would come up to me and say, Joe, have you considered changing the name of your church? And I always would give this answer. Well, we've talked about it, but the problem is we'll be lampooned for trying to hide who we were in the past. And, and we're not trying to hide anything. In fact, what we've done here is openly repented. And, and anyway, I'm going to say after about seven or eight other denominational presidents came over and made that suggestion to me, I thought, maybe we need to rethink this. And I remember in our internal discussion saying, we're, we're not trying to hide anything, but we've repented. And so we ought to run the other direction. We ought to run away from this past. We don't want to repeat any of that. And so that started the process of finding the right name. Grace Communion International seemed to, in retrospect, describe our whole journey. The other major change that the GCI has made is that women now serve in leadership roles, which is a huge change from the WCG that I grew up in, where women could play the piano in church or sing, or maybe lead a kid's youth group, often with their husband, but would never be allowed to even offer a prayer during a service. All the splinter groups still hold that women are to be quiet in church. Cagua is more liberal on that. <laughs> the other United, the original United, their leadership said, have said women shouldn't even write an article in explaining a scripture. But I, I, 
boy, it's been so long. I, I can't remember exactly what year it was that we started ordaining women elders, but we did a huge study about that. And we talked to denominational leaders in other denominations on why and when and how they did that. And so we've been ordaining women for 15 years, maybe. I don't know the percentage of female pastors. I would guess 10%. My wife is assistant pastor at our local congregation, and our pastor is a female. You know what? It, that wasn't that difficult of a change because people began to realize that you, sh in ministry, you serve out of your giftedness. And we fully believe in the ministry of all believers. Everyone that is converted by Jesus has a gift to give to the church. And unconsciously or consciously, there are churches who are denying the Holy Spirit's giftedness to women. And why would you deny half your church's gift? I mean, just, anyway, looking back now, it just doesn't even make any sense. Finally, I wanted to ask Joe Jr. if there was anything he regretted about the way he led the members of the Worldwide Church of God out of Armstrongism and into mainstream Christianity. I've thought about that over the years. Some of the things I did, my hand is forced by law. Retirement programs that we set up after the sale of our property in Pasadena. You know, that setting up that retirement program was pretty much done by lawyers. My, when I say pretty much, I mean mostly. My part was, was the, met with the lawyers, Joe, which one of these ways do you want to go into court battles with. If you do the program this way, you'll have this many lawsuits, or potentially. You'll have this many lawsuits if you do it this way. So I always would err on the least amount of litigation. And, and as it turns out, for us to set up a retirement program the way we did, when we did, was a blessing for many, but not for all. I lament that there wasn't sufficient money to give anyone who ever pastored for us a retirement, but there just wasn't enough money to do that. So yeah, that's one of the things I wish that could be different. Joseph Dukacs Jr. fairly recently retired as president of Grace Communion International, and he now lives a quieter country life near Eugene, Oregon, which is somewhat ironic given that that is where Herbert W. Armstrong originally started the Worldwide Church of God. I wanted to ask him if, in his retirement, he'd ever thought about what he hopes his legacy will be. Throughout this whole experience, because we were so cultish, I got to meet firsthand most of the counter-cult ministries in America and Canada. There, there are ministry organizations whose whole purpose is to counter what cults are teaching. So the Jehovah's Witnesses, as an example, so I met them all as I wanted to change their perception of us as we were making the changes. I wanted to demonstrate that our changes were genuine and not just to show, because there were a couple of counter cult ministries who were teaching that I am secretly in charge of United and other splinter groups, as well as GCI, and that I'm deriving an income from all of them. And so I went to the biggest ones maybe the top 10, and, and just said, interview me, examine me, I'll answer all the questions. And as I did that, I eventually, I think, showed them and demonstrated that we were sincere and genuine, and that you don't go from being a $100 million a year organization to $10 million a year, and that you're doing that as a, as a joke. There are still people who think that I have gold bars in a Swiss bank that I own an island in Hawaii. I just have a, a normal life with a three bedroom, two bath house in Junction City, Oregon. And I drive a 2007 pickup truck. So there are people who think that that's all a show and secretly I'm a billionaire. I can't change that. I, after meeting with all the counter cult ministries and going through everything I've gone through, if I am remembered for being one who helped move a, a group of people from the fringe to the fold, I can live with that. But probably most important in my heart of hearts, be remembered as a person who 
always pointed people to Jesus. That, that, would, that would make me happy. De-radicalizing a Christian cult is not without precedent, but it is a fairly unusual thing to happen in the trajectory of a high demand group. I hope that no matter where you fall on the spectrum of the changes, that you can appreciate the bravery and conviction that Joseph Tkach Jr. showed in trying to stand up for what he believed was right in the face of incredible pushback as he tried to take the Worldwide Church of God from the fringe to the fold. We hope you'll join us immediately after this episode for our series finale, which features the voices of many listeners in order to bring the Worldwide Church of God experience to a close, at least on this series. You can listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are made available. Worldwide, The Unchosen Church is written, produced, and hosted by me, Trisha Jenkins. Music in this episode was licensed by Soundstripe, and sound design and editing was done by 13 Media. If you'd like to send us a question or a comment, please reach out via email at worldwidepod11 at gmail.com or DM us on social media. You can find us as always on Instagram at worldwidepod, and Twitter and Facebook at WorldwidePod11. We hope that getting you to click on the next episode will be a lot easier than getting a camel through the eye of a needle. Worldwide, the Unchosen Church is also proud to support the hashtag I Got Out movement, which empowers survivors of cults and other high-demand groups to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn how you can share your story and support other survivors at igotout.org.